Dear Esther, the morning after I was washed ashore, salt in my ears, sand in my mouth, and the waves always at my ankles, I felt as though everything had conspired to this one last shipwreck. I remembered nothing but water, stones in my belly and my shoes, threatening to drag me under to where only the most listless of creatures swim. Donnelly reported the legend of the Hermit, a holy man who sought solitude in its most pure form. Allegedly, he rode here from the mainland in a boat without a bottom, so all the creatures of the sea could rise at night to converse with him. How disappointed he must have been with their chatter. Perhaps now, when all that haunts the ocean is the rubbish dumped from the tankers, he'd find more peace. They say he threw his arms wide in a valley on the south side and the cliff opened up to provide him shelter. They say he died of fever 116 years later. The shepherds left gifts for him at the mouth of the cave, but Donnelly records they never claim to have seen him. I have visited the cave and I have left my gifts, but like them, I appear to be an unworthy subject of his solitude. There was once talk of a wind farm out here, away from the rage and the intolerance of the masses. The sea, they said, is too rough for the turbines to stand. They clearly never came here to experience the becalming for themselves. Personally, I would have supported it. Turbines would be a fitting contemporary refuge for a hermit. The revolution and the permanence. reading Donnelly by the weak afternoon sunlight. He landed on the south side of the island, followed the path to the bay and climbed the mount. He did not find the caves and he did not chart the north side. I think this is why his understanding of the island is flawed, incomplete. He stood on the mount and only wondered momentarily how to descend, but then he didn't have my reasons. When someone had died or was dying, or was so ill they gave up what little hope they could sacrifice, they cut parallel lines into the cliff, exposing the white chalk beneath. You could see them from the mainland or the fishing boat, and know to send aid or impose a cordon of protection, and wait a generation until whatever pestilence stalked the cliff paths died along with its hosts. My lines are just for this to keep any would-be rescuers at bay. The infection is not simply of the flesh.
They were God-fearing people, those shepherds. There was no love in the relationship. Donnelly tells me that they had one Bible that was passed around in strict rotation. It was stolen by a visiting monk in 1776, two years before the island was abandoned altogether. In the interim, I wonder, did they assign chapter and verse to the stones and grasses, marking the geography with a superimposed significance that they could actually walk the Bible and inhabit its contradiction? Dear Esther, I met Paul. I made my own little pilgrimage. My Damascus, a small semi-detached on the outskirts of Wolverhampton. We drank coffee in his kitchen and tried to connect to one another. Although he knew I hadn't come in search of an apology, reason or retribution, he still spiralled in panic, thrown high and lucid by his own dented bonnet. Responsibility had made him old. Like us, he'd already passed beyond any conceivable boundary of life. I would leave you presents outside your retreat in this interim space between cliff and beach. I would leave you loaves and fishes, but the fish stocks have been depleted and I've run out of bread. I would row you back to your homeland in a bottomless boat, but I fear we would both be driven mad by the chatter of the sea creatures. He still maintains he wasn't drunk, but tired. I can't make the judgment or the distinction anymore. I was drunk when I landed here, and tired too. I walked up the cliff path in near darkness and camped in the bay where the trawler lies beached. It was only at dawn that I saw the bothy and decided to make my temporary lodgings there. I was expecting just the aerial and a transmitter stashed in a weatherproof box somewhere on the mount. It had an air of uneasy permanence to it. Like all the other buildings here, erosion seems to have evaded it completely.
Dear Esther, I have now driven the stretch of the M5 between Exeter and Bristol over 21 times. But although I have all the reports and all the witnesses and have cross-referenced them within a millimetre using my ordnance survey maps, I simply cannot find the location. You'd think there would be marks to serve as some evidence. It's somewhere between the turn-off for Sanford and the welcome brake services. But although I can always see it in my rear-view mirror, I have as yet been unable to pull ashore. All night the boy has kept me lucid. I sat when I was at the very edge of despair, when I thought I would never unlock the secret of the island. I sat at the edge and I watched the idiot boy blink through the night. He's mute and he's retarded and he has no thought in his metal head but to blink each wave and each minute aside until the morning comes and renders him blind as well as deaf mute. In many ways, we have much in common. I had kidney stones and you visited me in the hospital. After the operation, when I was still half submerged in anaesthetic, your outline and your speech both blurred. Now my stones have grown into an island and made their escape, and you have been rendered opaque by the car of a drunk. Is this what Paul saw through his windscreen? Not Lot's wife looking over her shoulder, but a scar in the hillside falling away to black forever. I've begun my ascent on the green slope of the western side. I've looked deep into the mountain from the shaft and understood that I must go up and then find the way under. I will stash the last vestiges of my civilization in the stone walls and work deeper from there. I'm drawn by the aerial and the cliff edge. There is some form of rebirth waiting for me there.
the Bothy was constructed originally in the early 1700s. By then, shepherding had formalized into a career. The first habitual shepherd was a man called Jakobsen from a lineage of migratory Scandinavians. He was not considered a man of breeding by the mainlanders. He came here every summer whilst building the Bothy, hoping eventually that becoming a man of property would secure him a wife and a lineage. Donnelly records that it did not work. He caught some disease from his malcontented goats and died two years after completing it. There was no one to carve white lines into the cliff for him either. My heart is landfill. These false dawns waking into the still never light. I sweat for you in the small hours and wrap my blankets into a mass. I have always heard the waves break on these lost shores, always the gulls forgotten. I can lift this bottle to my ear and all there ever is for me is this Hebridean music. What to make of Donnelly, the laudanum and the syphilis? It is clearly not how he began, but I've been unable to discover if the former was a result of his visiting the island or the force that drove him here. For the syphilis, a drunk driver smashing his insides into a pulp as he stumbled these paths, I can only offer my empathy. We're all victims of our age. My disease is the internal combustion engine and the cheap fermentation of yeast. They found Jakobsen in early spring. The thaw had only just come. Even though he'd been dead nearly seven months, his body had been frozen right down to the nerves and had not even begun to decompose. He'd struggled halfway down the cliff path, perhaps looking for some lost goat, or perhaps in a delirium, and expired, curled into a claw right under the winter moon. Even the animals shunned his corpse. The mainlanders thought to bring it home unlucky, Donnelly claims they dragged it to the caves to thaw out and rot, but he is proving an unreliable witness. Climbing down to the caves, I slipped and fell and have injured my leg. I think the femur is broken. It is clearly infected. The skin has turned a bright, tight pink, and the pain is crashing in on waves, winter tides against my shoreline, drowning out the ache of my stones. I struggled back to the bothy to rest, but it has become clear that there is only one way this is likely to end. The medical supplies I looted from the trawler have suddenly found their purpose. They will keep me lucid for my final ascent. Donnelly did not pass through the caves. From here on in, his guidance, unreliable as it is, has gone from me. I understand now that it is between the two of us and whatever correspondence could be drawn from the wet rocks.
There is no other direction, no other exit from this motorway. Speeding past this junction, I saw you waiting at the roadside, a one last drink in your trembled hands. If the caves are my guts, this must be the place where the stones are first formed. The bacteria phosphoresce and rise, singing through the tunnels. Everything here is bound by the rise and fall, like a tide. Perhaps the whole island is actually underwater.
This cannot be the shaft they threw the goats into. It cannot be the landfill where the parts of your life that would not burn ended up. It cannot be the chimney that delivered you to the skies. It cannot be the place where you rained back down again to fertilize the soil and make small flowers in the rocks. The moon over the Sanford Junction, headlights in your retinas. Donnelly drove a grey hatchback without a bottom. All the creatures of the tarmac rose to sing to him. All manner of symbols crudely scrawled across the cliff face of my unrest. My life reduced to an electrical diagram. All my gulls have taken flight. They will no longer roost on these outcrops. The lure of the moon over the Sanford Junction is too strong.
I returned home with a pocket full of stolen ash. Half of it fell out of my coat and vanished into the car's upholstery. But the rest I carefully stowed away in a box I kept in a drawer by the side of my bed. It was never intended as a meaningful act, but over the years it became a kind of talisman. I'd sit still, quite still for hours, just holding the diminishing powder in my palm and noting its smoothness. In time, we will all be worn down into granules, washed into the sea and dispersed. Hall, by the roadside, by the exit for Damascus, all ticking and cooled, all feathers and remorse, all of these signals rooted like traffic through the circuit diagrams of our guts, those badly written boats torn bottomless in the swells, washing us forever ashore. From here, I can see my armada. I collected all the letters I'd ever meant to send to you, if I'd have ever made it to the mainland, but had instead collected at the bottom of my rucksack, and I spread them out along the lost beach. Then I took each and every one, and I folded them into boats. I folded you into the creases, and then, as the sun was setting, I set the fleet to sail. Shattered into 21 pieces, I consigned you to the Atlantic, and I sat here until I'd watched all of you sink. Pain in my leg sent me blind for a few minutes as I struggled up the cliff path. I swallowed another handful of painkillers and now I feel almost lucid. The island around me has retreated to a hazed distance, whilst the moon appears to have descended into my palm to guide me. I can see a thick black line of infection reaching for my heart from the waistband of my trousers. Through the fugue, it's all the world like the path I have cut from the lowlands towards the aerial.
I've begun my voyage in a paper boat without a bottom. I will fly to the moon in it. I've been folded along a crease in time, a weakness in the sheet of life. Now you've settled on the opposite side of the paper to me. You can see your traces in the ink that soaks through the fiber, the pulped vegetation. When we become waterlogged and the cage disintegrates, we will intermingle. When this paper aeroplane leaves the cliff edge and carves parallel vapor trails in the dark, we will come together. If only Donnelly had experienced this, he would have realized he was his own shoreline, as am I. Just as I am becoming this island, so he became his syphilis, retreating into the burning synapse, synapse the stones, the infection. Bent back like a nail, like a hangnail, like a drowning man clung onto the wheel, drunk and spiraled, washed onto the lost shore under a moon as fractured as a shattered wing. We cleave, we are flight and suspended, these wretched painkillers, this form inconstant. I will take flight, I will take flight. with panic, deaf with the roar of the cage traffic, heart stopped on the road to Damascus, Paul sat at the roadside hunched up like a gull, like a bloody gull, as useless and as doomed as a syphilitic cartographer, a dying goat herd, an infected leg, a kidney stone, blocking the traffic bound for Sanford and Exeter. He was not drunk, Esther, he was not drunk at all. All his roads and his tunnels and his paths led inevitably to this moment of impact. This is not a recorded natural condition. He should not be sat there with his chemicals and his circuit diagrams. He should not be sat there at all. run out of places to climb. I will abandon this body and take to the air. Dear Esther, 
I have burnt my belongings, my books, this death certificate. Mine will be written all across this island. Who was Jacobson? Who remembers him? Donnelly has written of him, but who was Donnelly? Who remembers him? I have painted, carved, hewn, scored into this space all that I could draw from him. There will be another to these shores to remember me. I will rise from the ocean like an island without bottom, come together like a stone, become an aerial, a beacon, that they will not forget you. We have always been drawn here. One day the gulls will return and nest in our bones and our history. I will look to my left and see Esther Donnelly flying beside me. I will look to my right and see Paul Jacobson fly, fly beside me. They will leave white lines carved into the air to reach the mainland, where help will be sent. Come back.